Somebody feel better already. Somebody got breakthrough already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Ezekiel 37. Verse 7. This text for all the church girls, they're familiar with it. We in the valley of dry bones. If you're not a church girl, that's all right. We inducted you. Most of the church girls became club girls and then we back to being church girls, so don't let the church. <laughs> now y'all know. Now y'all know. Some of the church girls, still club girls, be straddling the fence and that's all right, God is still working. It's not all right or is it all right? I don't know, I'm confused. Can't remember if it's all right or not all right. It's confusing, it's all confusing up here. Um, okay, here we go. Ezekiel 37 and seven. If you're a pastor's wife, will you wave at me? Hey, thank you, pastor's wives, for being here, bringing your community and your sisters. PKs, wave at me. Ooh, I know y'all tired of church. Thank y'all for giving us another chance, coming to another conference. I see my sisters over there are standing for the reading of the word. That is a thing that we do. I want you to feel comfortable here, but we could just honor this moment. I'm gonna try and be fast. Ezekiel. It's all right. 37 and 7. The prophet Ezekiel has been taken out into the spirit and dropped into the valley of dry bones. He's in this valley and the Lord is showing him things. Verse 7 is right in the middle of what God has shown him. I'm going to give you the cliff notes for those of you unfamiliar. The spirit of the Lord takes him into this valley. It's nothing but dry bones. And God asked the prophet Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he says, Lord, only you know. He says, prophesy to these bones. And he prophesies as he was commanded. And the bones, they get muscle and tissue and flesh comes over them. But there is no breath in the bones. When we enter the text in verse 7, they are what I would call the walking dead. They look put together. They look like they should have breath in them, but they don't. Traditionally, when I've heard anyone kind of preach this text, they start from the moment that they are dry bones, but when I was studying, God told me to start from the point where they are put together but don't have breath because so many of us in this room are put together. But we just don't have any breath. Or we're down to our last breath. We don't start holding our breath because we have plenty of it. We're holding our breath because it's the only thing I got that's keeping me together. And when we find this text in verse seven, it says, that Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. So also the Lord said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. 
Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. I got territory set aside just for you. You're not just going to live, but I'm going to position you. It's one thing to live, but you're not going to live lost. I'm going to take you into your own land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. I'm not just a God who speaks. I perform. I can back up anything I say. I'll put my money where my mouth is. I'll put my power where my mouth is. If God says it, he's going to perform. Spirit of the living God, Woman Evolve is an idea that started in your mind, and what an honor it is to be a part of it. God, I spent all last year and some of this year thinking I'd never see these women again, that maybe somewhere along the way the need wouldn't exist anymore, God, but you are so faithful that you kept this thing alive, God. And now we stand and we wait to hear what you have to say. God, I turn myself over to you and I say, have your way. Bless this word, God, as only you can do. Let it touch every woman connected to this experience. 33 countries, God. Let your word go forth in 33 countries. 10,000 women, God. Let your word meet each and every last one of them gathered in churches to receive this experience, God. Let your word touch each and every last one of them to the extent that lives would be changed, touched, and transformed. God, I pray for the spirit of wisdom, of prophecy, of power, and authority. Bless me, God, that I may stand one foot in heaven and the other foot in the potter's house, Dallas, prophesying as you say, pouring as you pour. Bless this moment, bless this conference, bless our time together, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Okay, now y'all can sit down. You stood and sit down, stood and sit down. If you're watching online, I hope you typed amen in the comments because you know if you don't put amen in the comments it's like the prayer never happened it's like I have to tell you this story I went to um, one of those like chain wax places a few years ago when I first moved to Los Angeles and I went (laughs) I went this one time and you know it was one of my sisters a little black girl there and she was waxing me up and she was like looking at me funny and um you know I didn't know why she was looking at me funny but she was looking at me funny and then she gets down to wax in the areas and um she looks up from the areas and goes that's where I know you from and I was like don't do me you don't know me don't that's not you don't don't try me because it okay don't do that she was like, I see your videos on YouTube. I was like, whew, thank you, Jesus. The blood covers. Because I didn't know what she was talking about. So I was like, okay, as much as I love the delegation, like, I don't want to necessarily, you know, because, and then, and that's not, you know. And so I said, I'm going to go to the whitest part of town I can go on and pray they didn't see girl get up because... So I went to this side of town, and I found me a white girl. And hey, white girls, thank y'all for coming to this mostly black event. We love y'all. Come on, Latinas. Thank y'all for coming. We always go to y'all stuff. Y'all come to our stuff. It's almost like this is what heaven going to look like. We thank y'all. Feel comfortable here, okay? Um, Listen. No, I do. I love to see when my white sisters come because I'm like, we sisters and we ought to be able to experience each other's cultures. I'm at the wax place with the white girl and she's getting ready to wax me. And then she asks me, what ethnicity are you? And I'm like, black. <laughs> I didn't want to get into the whole racist and social construct. It was just like a limited time. And I was like, I'm black. 
black. Like, do I look like something else? I'm black, okay? <laughs> and um, she was like, yeah, but like, you know, where did you like originate from? And I was like, Charleston, West Virginia, girl, I'm black. What are we, what are we doing? Why can't I just get a wax when I go places? Okay. And then she was like, okay, but like, have you ever done ancestry? Because I've heard Nigerians have a tighter curl pattern. And like, she is, yes, come on Nigerians, right? Ancestry.com, right? So, um, so I was like, let me go and do my ancestry test. Cause I can't have a white girl telling me more about how black I am than I know that I'm black. So I want to have an answer next time somebody asks me about how black I am. I want to know where my black came from. And so I went on ancestry.com and they told me that, you know, I'm mostly Nigerian. Bishop Jakes is here. Can we honor Bishop Jakes? He's a, uh, hey daddy. My mama is here too. Okay. I think, I'm just glad she's here because she said she was hosting a conference called Woman Evolved this weekend. I like to call her Sarah Senior. Um, all right, just one more. Pastor Trey is here too because that's my man. Okay. <laughs> okay. Y'all stay focused, I'm trying to preach. Every time I get started, y'all start, and that's not what we're here for. Um, so I go to Ancestry.com and I find out that most of my Nigerian, thanks to Bishop Jakes, like I'm like 70%, you know, which that's a lot. I'm Igbo, just so you know. Yes. Um, and so now that I started like Googling more about my ancestry and where I came from, there are certain features that I can identify as Igbo, certain like body builds where I guess I'm like, they're probably Nigerian like me. <clears throat> it was so interesting to me though, because until I had an awareness of where I'd come from, I couldn't identify things from that native country. As a black woman in America, we were exiled from our ancestry. And for some reason, I believe that my history began where the exile occurred. And it wasn't until I did the work to understand my ancestry that I realized that my history began long before the exile occurred. And so there are certain things that I see as uniquely Igbo, uniquely Nigerian that I can identify now and I feel more connected to that native country even though I experienced a period of being exiled. That was interesting to me in the landscape of this conference and this experience because I felt like so many of us understand what it's like to be Exiled. Exiled is having been expelled and barred from one's native country. The thing about being exiled, like I experienced, is that if you're exiled long enough, you'll forget what life was like before you begin living in a foreign land. Some of us in this room have been exiled away from our native land. I'm not talking about our ethnicity now. I'm talking about us being exiled to the foreign land of grief, to the foreign land of depression, the foreign land of worry, the foreign land of doubt. And sometimes it starts off foreign, but eventually it becomes our norm. I'm just kind of getting used to walking around broken. I'm just kind of used to walking around with no expectations anymore. If you've been exiled long enough, you'll start to give up on what life was like before I got barred from joy, before I got barred from peace. Some of us, it's not like we can just access joy. I feel barred from it. I feel barred from hope, barred from confidence. There are some circumstances that take place in our life that are so devastating that we feel exiled. And I was thinking about this in the context of what's happening in the text because these children of he the Hebrew children, the Israels in this text have been exiled from their land. And spiritually, 
they are beginning to take on the characteristics of the foreign land that they're living in. They're hopeless. Their bones are dry. They feel cut off. And they have forgotten, maybe like some of you in this room, that your spirit has a native country. In Jeremiah 1 and 5, it says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, let's do King James, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. You lived somewhere else before you were formed in your mother's womb. I'm putting you in your mother's womb, but technically your mother's womb should be foreign to you. Because before I placed you in your mother's womb, you were from somewhere else. I knew you in heaven. I knew you in the spiritual realm. I understood and connected with you on a level that humanity can't even connect with. Before I formed thee in your mother's belly, I knew you. That word yada, it's an intimacy. We were one with God. My spirit used to be one with God. There was no separation between me nor God. I was so intimate with God that I took on the attributes of God. I was holy because I was connected to holiness. I was whole because I was connected to wholeness. I had peace because I was connected to peace. I had love because I was connected to love. Before I even touched down in this earth, before I even took my first breath, I was connected to the holiness of God. Put it on the screen for me. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That word sanctified means I made you holy. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations, and I gave you something to say. I put words in your mouth. Come on, can we rest on that for a minute? I know it's hard to remember what it was like before you were exiled from heaven, but I want you to know that even though we are no longer tapped into heaven the way we were before we were formed in our mother's womb, that we still have access to that native country. And if you don't believe that you still have access, then this conference is just going to be something cute for you, and you're going to go Go home the same way that you came. But if you can remember that I did not start from the place where I was exiled. I started from a place that you cannot see. That means heaven's got a house with my name on it. Heaven knew exactly where I was going to be in this season in my life because before I came here, heaven laid out the road map. Heaven gave me enough spirit for the life ahead of me. Heaven gave me enough strength for the life ahead of me. Heaven knew me. Heaven is saying my name. Heaven understood why I needed to be in this room because heaven knew that it was saying my name. Something in this room was going to echo and it was going to remind me of where I've come from. You see, somebody came to a conference, but somebody else came because they heard something that sounds like their native language. It sounds like you speak heaven the way that I understand heaven. It sounds like you speak God the way that I understand God. It sounds like you speak deliverance and I'm trying to get back to my native land. It would be one thing if I was okay being exiled, but I came all the way to Dallas. I'm logged on at work because I'm trying to get back to my native land. I don't believe what this hell is trying to say about me. I don't believe what this circumstance. I'm trying to step over my situation and step back to the place where heaven formed me. I'm trying to get back connected to holiness. I'm trying to get back connected to who I was before I touched down here. Because who I was there had enough power for here. God, I wish I could say it the way that I feel it. If I can get a revelation about who I was before they left me, if I could get a revelation about who I was before my daddy walked away from me, if I could get a revelation about who I was before I lost the job. See, all of this is human stuff. And I didn't start in human stuff. I started in the spirit. I started with a God that is greater than anything you can understand. And the problem is that hell is trying to push me back down. But I I remember where I came from. Don't you forget where you came from. Don't forget where you came from. You are not of this earth. You are a God daughter of the most high God. Before God formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you. He said, I know Tanya. I know Sarah. I know Cora. And I'm only sending her down because she's ready. God didn't half make you. He didn't give you just a little bit to work with. I'm going to give her everything she needs for the road ahead of her and I'm not going to release you from heaven until you got enough power for the journey 
you don't understand. But that's all right, I only need a few of us to understand. You feel like you're running out of breath. God said, impossible. Because before I formed you in your mother's womb, I put enough breath in you for the life ahead of you. You think you're running out of strength. I came to tell you it's impossible. Because before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I didn't put you in this earth with just enough to get you halfway there. We ain't doing no half-stepping. Who came all of this way to do some half-stepping? If I'm going to step in this world, if I'm going to step in this earth, I'm going to step in it with all of heaven's resources backing me up. I wish a half-stepping somebody would run up on a Woman Evolve conference. What you think this is? I will push you back into the fullness of who God called you to be. You're not running out of breath. As a matter of fact, you're about to dig deeper. I hear God saying, you got to exhale. Because when you exhale, you can inhale. See, you holding on to that breath. And God says, I wish you would let it go. I wish you would just cry the ugly cry. I wish you would just say that you're broken. I wish you would just say that you're worried. Because if you would finally let that thing go, I can show you what else I put down in you. You think we serve a God of one breath? God said, I will multiply thee. He's not just multiplying your money. He's not just multiplying your friends. He's multiplying your breath. If you bad, I dare you to take a breath. If you bold, I dare you to take a breath. If you really bad about it, I dare you to take a breath. Because if you take a breath, heaven says, I'm going to show you you got more in you than you think. I'm going to show you what I knew when I formed you in your mother's womb. I made you holy. You are not a broken little girl. You are not unlovable. You are not someone who cannot be held down. I was holding you down before your mother ever held you. I got to get back to holy. I got to get back to glory. God increased my thoughts. God increased my mind. God changed my focus. I'm focused on what's happening here, but you're focused on what's happening there. And God, if you're not going to change here, then pull me up to there. I'm trying to get a revelation. I'm trying to get breakthrough. And this breakthrough I can't get right here. Pull them up, 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 we got fire, we got fire. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, pull them up, Holy Spirit, pull them up. Up out of that depression, up out of that despair, up out of that boring old life they live in. Pull them up, pull them up, bring them back to life. Awake my soul, help me to see why I'm here again. Pull them up, pull them up, pull them up. God, pull up. Pull me up, pull me up. Pull me up, pull me up. Pull me up, pull me up. I feel like having fun. Pull me up, pull me up. Pull me up, pull me up. Pull me up, pull me up. God, pull me up out of this. God, I'm depressed. Pull me up out of this. God, I'm broken. Pull me up out of this. God, I don't have resources, but my God has infinite resources. There's a disconnect here. I'm the one disconnected. Pull me up to the way you think. Pull me up to the way you pray. Pull me up to the way you do miracles. Pull me up until hell doesn't just get nervous, but gives up and goes back and picks on somebody else who don't have a revelation. Hell being nervous is over. Hell got to back up off of me. Then, pull me up. Pull me up. Gotta get back to my native country. I'm not of this world. I didn't start here, I started with God. You didn't start here, you started with God. 
Your life did not begin when the divorce happened. Your life did not begin when the abortion occurred. Your life did not begin when the addiction happened, nor did it end. That didn't have anything to do with what, who God is. God says, I'm holy enough to be with you when you're in addiction, and I'm still holy enough to be with you when you're in ministry. And if you get a revelation of my holiness, then you'll start tapping into holiness and get out of your feelings and get out of your past and get out of your emotions, and you'll step into my holiness and you'll say God I want to be sanctified again God can you make me holy again remove anything in me that's making me dirty when you've called me to be pure and I hear God saying I don't care how dirty you've been I can still sanctify you because I'm just that holy I'm holy enough to be in Dallas and holy enough to be in Africa I'm holy enough to be in Dallas and holy enough to be in your house I'm holy enough to be in your finances and holy enough to be in your mind. I'm holier than you've ever seen before. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 you lack nothing. Holy, holy, holy. You got everything you need. Holy, holy, holy. Do you know who I am? You forgot how holy I am. I am not your father. I am not your mother. I am not your lover. I am not your friend. Jesus is not your boyfriend. You serve a holy God. I'll clean you right up. I'm holy enough to comfort your grief and end their pain. You don't have to worry about what will happen if it doesn't go the way you want it to. Because God is holy enough to see you through whatever it is. I got wisdom, I got insight, I got power. But my job is to become sanctified again. I'm not asking you to be something you've never been before. God says I wouldn't call you to it if I didn't already put it in you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I sanctified you. Not I was going to sanctify you. Not I had plans. You were holy before you got in your mother's womb. No wonder the serpent's intention in Genesis 3 is to make us question God's intentions. Because if I can get you to question God's intentions, then you will question the holiness of God. And you'll think that God is trying to keep something from you. But when you have a revelation about God's holiness, you'll know that if God is keeping it from me, then it must, it's must gonna harm me. It must not mean well by me. And in my text, this moment has taken place if you read Ezekiel 36, because God says, my holiness is on the line. Somebody came into this room and they think it's about their circumstance. They think it's about their situation. But the truth is, I'm questioning God's holiness. God, I don't know if I'm honest that you know what you're doing. All right, okay. I don't know if you know what you're doing. Because if you knew what you were doing, certainly, why would you allow this pain, this grief, this disease? 
So you took your breath back. And you took your worship back. And you took your trust back and you took your faith back. Because I lost faith in God's holiness. God, how can my marriage be in trouble? I'm going to take my... I'm going to take my faith back. I'm going to hold on to it. Because mm. when I gave it to you, you, you kind of disappointed me. When I gave it to you, it didn't go the way that I thought it should, so I'm going to just take that back. When we find Israel in the text, they started serving other gods. They probably didn't know it fully because they probably still had God somewhere in the mix. But they started serving, because <laughs> you don't just take your trust back from God, you place it in something else. I took my trust from God, now I'm going to trust my brokenness because my brokenness says I can't trust God. So it's not like you just move your faith from God, you just switched it to another pot. Now I'm going to have faith in my own decisions, I'm going to have faith in my own plans, I'm going to have faith in other people, I'm going to have faith that someone else will fix me because when I gave it to God, he didn't perform the way I thought he should perform. But Israel has spent 70 years now exiled from the land that God gave them. And because they have spent 70 years here exiled from this land, they're now in a dilemma because their bones are dry. This text, Buried Alive, it's what I'm calling this message. This is what happens to us when we find ourselves in predicaments where we are alive but we feel buried by what has exiled us. Is anybody in this room buried alive? I'm alive but I'm buried. I'm buried in uncertainty. I wouldn't even call it depression. I wouldn't call it grief. I'm just buried and I don't even know why I'm here. And I can't see beyond that any longer. Israel is buried alive and I wanted to study three things about what happens to us when we're buried alive. What happens to us when we're down to our last breath. Israel says it for us, but I want to break it down in Ezekiel 37. It says that they said that their bones were dry. So he gives the revelation that this is Israel. And he says to them, our bones, the Israel says, our bones are dry. Let's talk about that for a second if you're taking notes. If you're looking for three signs, you're down to your last breath. Number one, your bones are dry. Somebody says, sis, I put on lotion. I don't know what you're talking about. You lost me. These bones are not dry. I put on Vaseline, just like my grandmother told me. That word bones, it, it means substance. I don't have any substance anymore. If faith is the substance of things hoped for, and my substance has ran dry, when your bones are dry, it means I don't even know what I'm made of anymore. I don't even know who I am anymore. That's what it feels like when your bones are dry. My substance is dried up. Number two says that our hope is lost. I love that it says the hope is lost. It didn't say hope is gone. Because hope being lost means that I have it one day, I don't have it the next. That word lost literally means wondering. So I don't have any substance. One day I have hope, the next day I don't. And then it says you're cut off. That means that where I was once standing tall, I'm now cut off. 
Maybe it's not in my career. Maybe it's in my relationship. Maybe it's not in my relationship. It's in my career. Maybe it's my faith. My faith feels cut off. I experienced church hurt. I wasn't able to get over why God didn't deliver the way that I thought that he would, and so I have been cut off. This is where Israel is when we find them in the text. And he says to the prophet Ezekiel that this is exactly where they are. But I have an assignment that's going to bring them back to life. When God gets ready to restore Israel, he gives a prophet a vision. So while Israel feels cut off, there's a prophet that sees them alive. While Israel feels like they have no more hope, there's a prophet somewhere that sees them alive. So you have to understand what's happening behind the scenes of the text. Behind the scenes of the text, Israel is down to their last breath. But on the other side of the text, God has given a word saying exhale, because I want them to come to a place where they feel like they're out of breath, but the moment that you begin speaking, breath is going to come back to them. I'm not even talking about Ezekiel anymore. I'm talking about what's happening at the woman evolve experience. Experience. God says, I'm going to give them just enough breath to get in the room because when they get in the room, I need you to see them alive. I need you to see them functioning at their highest version of themselves. I need you to see them powerful. I need you to see them Holy Ghost filled. I need you to see them stronger than they've ever been. God gave me a vision that somebody was going to be connected to this experience. And because they were connected to this experience, that breath was going to come back to them. The Ruach of God, the breath of God is coming back. That word Ruach it means spirit. He says that they're alive, but they don't have breath. They're buried alive, but my ruach, my breath, my spirit is coming to them. They don't know it yet, but the spirit is on the way. They don't know it yet, but they just took a breath of my spirit. They were worshiping, but they thought they was just singing a song. They didn't realize that my breath was coming back to them. And the prophet Ezekiel says, he says, command the wind. Let's go. He says, prophesy to the breath. I prophesy to your breath. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy to the breath that God breathed in you when he formed you in your mother's womb. I prophesy to that breath he put in Adam and then into Eve. I prophesy to your breath in Africa. I prophesy to your breath in India. I prophesy to your breath in Australia. And because you don't believe that the breath can come from you, God says, I'm going to send the four winds from the earth because the breath isn't even in you. It's outside of you. And the wind is going to blow. And when the wind blows, you better catch the breath when the wind blows. I hear God saying it's coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. The north, the south, the east, and the west. The north, the south, the east, and the west. South, make some noise in this place. East coast, make some noise in this place. North, make some noise in this place. West coast, where you at? The north, the south, the east, and the west. Somebody brought some wind with them. Did anybody pack a little wind? I know you packed your eyelashes, but did anybody pack a little wind? That word wind means a violent exhale. It means the kind of exhale that blows depression out of the way. This breath isn't coming from in you. Stop trying to dig down. I hear God saying the breath is coming from around you. The north, the south, and the east, and the west. I command the wind to come into your body in the name of Jesus. I command the wind to come into your situation in the name of Jesus. The wind, 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 the wind. wind. My breath is coming from the wind. My strength is coming from the wind. I hear a sound. I hear a sound. I hear a sound like a mighty rushing, a mighty rushing, a mighty rushing wind. I hear the sound. The wind. The wind is coming for cancer. The wind is coming for depression. This wind's not coming from in you. You're in the right place at the right time, sitting by the next woman, and you better secure your wig, because I have a feeling that before these 48 hours are up, that there's going to be a wind blowing in this place. Did anybody come to experience the wind? I hear God saying, you can get the wind going right now, that your worship is a sign to the wind, that your praise is a sign to the wind.
Jesus. Who brought their wind? Who brought their wind? If you breathe it out, it'll get violent. That word wind means violent exhale. That violent exhale means that that wind is coming to go to war. It means that wind is coming to come up against every weapon that has been formed against you. That wind is coming for your brokenness. That wind is coming for your anger. That wind is coming for your joy. That wind is coming for your peace. It's carrying. The wind carries things with it. The wind carries things with it. And anything that God didn't send is going to get swept away in the wind. And when the dust settles, there's not going to be any doubt that the wind was in this room and I wish I had about two crazy people who wouldn't mind lifting up their wind who wouldn't mind lifting up their voices exhale 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 I'm out of breath, but I got a little wind. I'm barely here, but I got a little wind. If you take your little wind and I take my little wind, then maybe the wind of all winds, maybe the great I am, maybe the Holy Spirit wind will take this little bit of wind that we got left and blow it in the direction of our circumstances. God, throw your weight around. How is God going to throw his weight around? The wind is going to throw his weight around. I'm going to be in this room one day. I'm going to be in Africa the next day. I'm going to throw my weight happening right now the wind 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 God says to Israel I'm gonna open your grave I'm gonna open your grave, you can't open this grave by yourself. There are some graves that you cannot open by yourself. And that's why you've been struggling to get out. And that's why you've been struggling to find how do I make my way out of this situation, God says. You're going to need the wind for this. I'm going to open your grave and I'm going to cause you to come out of your grave. That word yours is possession. You've gotten so comfortable in that grave that if I don't call you, cause you to come out of it, I could open the grave and you would still stay in it. I'll open your grave and I'm going to cause you to come out of it. God, the grave can't keep you. That grave that's holding what's trying to die on the inside of you. God says, I'll open your grave. If you'll trust me, if you'll believe me, if you'll have just a little bit of faith, I'll open, I'll open your grave. You're buried, but you're still alive. You're buried, but you're still here. I hear God saying, I am the God of your grave. And I'll open your grave and I'll give you the strength to come out of it. You are not dead. Your spirit is still alive. Your hope is still alive. Your miracle is still alive. God's love is still alive on the inside of you. Come out of your grave. Come out of those grave clothes. It is not time for a funeral. You still have life left to live. You still have joy yet to tap in. Come out of your grave. Have joy again. I dare you to laugh. I dare you to have peace again. I dare you to come out of your grave. so that God can put his spirit in you. 
Does anybody want to receive God's spirit? I'm going to pray with you. You're in this room. And you want the grave to let you go. Somebody's experienced something devastating, <laughs> lethal. It's trying to kill my marriage. It's trying to kill my family. I'm addicted. I'm strung out. I can't tell the truth if you paid me. I can't get this brokenness off of me. I can't see myself the way other people see me and I keep sabotaging even my relationship with God. This thing is trying to kill you. It's not cute. It's not something that you're just going to live with. I don't care how many women in your circle are coping with it. God is calling you out of that grave. And if you're going to wait for any woman to come with you, you may be in that grave one minute longer than you're supposed to be in there. Somebody's going to have to come out of that grave if they're the only one to do it. I may have to leave my mother in that grave. I may have to leave my friends in that grave, but I am not going to keep living this way. I'm not going to keep questioning my worth. I'm not going to keep putting myself on clears. God is calling me out of this grave. He's calling me out of depression. He's calling me out of brokenness. He's calling those drugs out of my vein. He's pulling me out of despair. God is calling me out of that grave. If that's you, I want you to step out of your seat and rush down to this altar. If you're watching online, I want you to step out of where you are. Just take one step. You're in the office. Take one step away from your desk. I want you to come out of your grave. Come out of your grave. God is calling you out of your grave. Out of your grave. I want, I want out of this grave. I want out of this grave. This grave is trying to take me out. This grave is trying to change my name. This grave is trying to make me believe that I'm not worthy. It's trying to kill me. This grave is trying to kill me. It's trying to bury me alive. That I would be alive but not really be present. That I would be alive but not really be awake. I'm buried alive. I'm here but I'm not here. I want out. I want out. I want out. I want out, I want to be delivered. I want to be sanctified. I want to experience holiness. Yes, me. Me with the abortion, I want holiness. Me with all of the lovers, I want holiness. Me with the wounds, me with the divorce, yeah, I want out. God, I want to come out of this grave, this place that has become comfortable to me. I don't know what life is like outside of this grave. I was born in a grave. Generations of women in my family battling the same thing over and over again. Somebody said, I never stood a chance. God says, you didn't start with those women in your family. You started with me. You didn't start in that city. You started with me. You didn't start in that relationship. You started with me. And it ain't over until God says it's over. You might have to fight this thing. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna tell you that God is just gonna pull that thing up off of you. For somebody that may happen, but that's not everybody's testimony. Some of us have to face off with the grave. Some of us have to fight some battles that we don't wanna be in. Some of us have to sign up for some wars that we would rather not be in. But you don't do it with your own strength. You will end up in a grave if you try to fight it with your own strength. You will be tired if you fight it with your own strength. But if you say, God, you allowed this thing to happen in my life. And I don't have strength to face it. So God, I'm going to need you to cause me to come out of the grave. I was reading this text and I couldn't help but wonder, God, why didn't you just pull them? Why didn't you just move? You God, 
Why you got to open the grave? That's too many steps for you personally. I have to do that, but why do you have to do that? Because Israel's going to end up in a grave again. But they need to know that the grave has an opening. That the grave isn't sealed shut. And if I just pull them out, the next time they end up in a grave, they'll forget that this grave has an opening. So even when I'm in the grave, I'm in the grave with expectation that this thing has an opening. This is not going to be the death of me. My life is not going to end here. My memory, my legacy will not end here. This grave, your grave has an opening. It's going to suck for a little bit. It's going to be dark for a minute. But my God is going to be a light unto my path. He's going to be a lamp unto my feet. And he's going to help me see in the middle of the grave. you're here in this room and all God wants is access to your grave and faith is the only response that you can give to him just a little bit of faith that God will pull you out of a grave God we've seen some graves not just over the last two years, over our lifetime. Buried alive over and over again. Every time I thought my head was coming out of the water, God just six feet under again. God says, I can open that grave. But you got to give me access. And you have to break covenant with your grave. You got to want to come out of it. It's your grave. But when you say this grave don't belong to me anymore, this grave was sent by hell. And because this grave was sent by hell, I don't want anything to do with it. So God, anytime you're ready to come open this thing, I'm ready to come out of it. Anytime you're ready to pull me up out of it, I'm ready to do the work to climb out of it. I want you to lift your hands and worship in this place want us to begin to allow God access, access to those graves. God, God, only you know the graves in this room. God, only you know the pain, only you know the brokenness, only you know the despair. And God, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. God, you called us holy. God, you sanctified us before we were in our mother's womb. God, that's what you did. And so when I offer myself as a living sacrifice, it's because I want anything that's in me that doesn't look like what you sanctified to be burnt off. And God, I know that that includes the grave. I want this grave to get up off of me. I smell like dead stuff. I smell like bitterness. I smell like brokenness. And I don't want it in me any longer. I don't want it in me any longer. God, pull her out of her grave. God, pull her out of her grave. God, pull this woman out of her grave. Help to come to a place, God, I want to get to each and every last one of you. God, I want out. Let your spirit fall. Resurrect in power, God. In the grave. Resurrect in power in the grave, God. We open our spirits to you, God. And we acknowledge your holiness. There is no one like you in all the earth, God. We've tried, we've searched, and we came up empty. God, and we make room for you in this tomb. Recognizing that your desire is to pull us out and to allow us to experience your glory and your presence in a fresh way. God, thank you for this time to be reminded of why we were sanctified, for this time of being reminded of why you chose us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh in the lives of my sisters. Fall fresh in their souls, God. 
God, let your wind blow in this room. Let your wind fill this place as only it can. From the north, the south, the east, and the west. Let it blow through the technology. Let it touch Halima, God. Let it touch all of the Halimas who we didn't even get a chance to meet. God, let your wind blow in this place. Let there be fresh power and fresh fire. Let your Holy Ghost fall, God. We speak to every dead thing and we cause it to be resurrected in the name of Jesus. You are not what you've gone through. You are not who your mother said you are. You are not who your father said you are. You are a daughter of the Most High God and who the Son has set free. My God, you're free indeed. God, I thank you for what you've decided to do in this place. Let there be breakthrough, God, in her belly. In her belly. Let there be rivers of living water flowing like never before God and we speak power and we speak authority and we speak impartation let the rivers flow let it flow let it flow let it flow Spirit of the living God, we decree and declare this is your daughter and death cannot have her. Brokenness will not have the last say. God, I thank you that you've already doing a work done on the end. Make it whole. Make it whole. I bind you, Satan. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We speak wholeness. We speak breakthrough. We speak power. God, rivers, 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 rivers of living water. Let it flow out of her mouth until she prophesies, until the dry bones come back to life. I've been wanting to get you for a long time. God, you know what's up. And I say, come forth. Come forth, oh God. Let her receive it, Jesus. An impartation, God. And we thank you that it's already done. That we got victory in this place. That this will not have the last say. 